Wow, it's warm here, oh, really nice. I think I'll sit over here. I am beyond thrilled to be able to discuss moonshots and abundance with two pretty amazing human beings. Steve Jurvetson, whose current board responsibilities include everything from SpaceX to Planet Labs to um, Tesla Motors and, and many others, and Naveen Jain, the founder of uh, Moon Express, uh, World Innovation Institute, as well as Blue Dot, to name a few. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, thinking about the moonshots in a very literal definition, um, you're among the first investors of SpaceX, you are a DIY rocketeer, and you own a pretty amazing collection of space treasures, including a large chunk of moon. Where does your interest to moon stem from? Well, uh, and the space sure. in general. Yeah, yeah. I think any kid growing up in the 60s or 70s must have been enamored with the space program back then, before the space shuttle kind of made it boring again. It was an incredible frontier of exploration. It motivated tons of people to study engineering and math and science. And so I think I was one of those people. I went to space camp at the Johnson Space Center, and I wrote little computer games that involved little spaceships. And if I could think as a child of my present self, I would just not believe that it's possible to be involved with projects like we're involved with today. The things that Naveen is doing, that Elon Musk is doing, are just breathtaking, right? Colonizing other worlds. It's the, it's the stuff of dreams. I, I, how could you not be interested in this? Oh, yeah, you know? that's so true. Yeah. And Naveen, you're, uh, as I said already, your company won the first approval from the U.S. Uh, government to make an unmanned mission to the moon. What on earth are you going to do there? Well, I mean, if you think about it, landing on the moon is not just about landing on the moon. The, when we land on the moon, not only we become the first company ever to do so, but more importantly, we become the fourth superpower. And what that really means is that next set of superpowers are going to be an entrepreneur sitting right here, and it's not going to be the nation states. That means every single thing that used to be the domain of nation states, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it is manufacturing, it's all those are going to be disrupted by entrepreneurs. And the old guards are going down. That means half of the Fortune 500 companies won't be around in the next 20 years. And when the old guard goes down, it opens the opportunity for every one of us to become the king of our own sector. <laughs> That's pretty mind-boggling, I have to say. Hey, but in the 60s, going to the moon was not just about, you know, getting there, as you said. Um, it was a much bigger project. It expanded our mindset and changed our thinking of what's possible and what's not by just looking at the, the amazing astron astronauts pulling off something so extraordinary. Now, thinking about today and the moonshots needed today to stretch our thinking and to help us make the next leap as a humanity forward, what are those moonshots that we need? Mm. Do you want to go first? Well, sure. I mean, mm -hmm. so the many moonshots, I mean, think about the biggest problem on facing humanity are the biggest opportunity for entrepreneurs to solve. So if you look at the rising cost of healthcare, what if the sickness was optional? What if we understood our body such deeply that we knew every metabolite in our body, every microbiome in our body, and we are able to not only understand it, but to be able to change it? And in that case, not only the sickness becomes optional, I would argue the death becomes optional. Right? Yeah. And that same thing will apply to everything from education, abundance, creating abundance of fresh water, creating abundance of energy, creating abundance of food. And all those things are possible today, and some entrepreneur is going to do that because of all the confluence of exponential technologies are going to make it possible, whether it's a stem cell technology or whether it is a artificial intelligence, or many things are simply the tools and the technology that are built on top of each other that's going to make it possible. Steve? Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I, when I think of moonshots, the term gets used often for a reason. Something that was thought to be impossible, something for which we don't see how we get there from here, yet someone puts a stake in the ground, rallies folks behind it, and, and we achieve the impossible. So I think in medicine and healthcare, there's a lot of that around curing cancer. I would say providing free healthcare information and diagnostics for everyone forever is one of those moonshots. The current sort of healthcare industrial system may not ever get there, but some new entrant might say, look, there's going to be two going to six billion people online. They all need free healthcare via the cell phone. Let's make that happen. I think in the area of agriculture, getting off meat entirely grown from animals, but onto meat grown in a laboratory or in a manufacturing facility 
is essential. I mean, it's like one of the biggest things we can do for climate change. So obviously moonshots that we're invested in are yeah. getting off fossil fuels entirely, making all vehicles electric, all vehicles autonomous, getting off animals. I mean, I love meat, I love bacon. We don't need to rip it off of pigs and cows. So, you know, it's a really barbaric way to get meat. That could be another moonshot. I think in, obviously, in genomics and cancer and health, I think in deep learning and AI applied to everything, I think every industry is going to go through a change and that itself may not be a moonshot because it's going to happen anyway, but perhaps dealing with the governance, the, the uh, institutional change that will be required in laws when we have sentient beings that are smarter than humans, kind of an interesting challenge to think about in advance of getting there. Um, obviously colonizing other worlds, Mars and the moon. These are moonshots, literally, and they don't even seem like the most daunting things we're taking on. I mean, they, yeah. it's almost like we need a higher hurdle, like interstellar travel, to really get us thinking outside the box. These, these are big themes and really big areas. How can we get there? Like, what is the best way of getting there? You're mentioning uh, entrepreneurs and exponential technologies. Like, what about collaboration? What type of collaboration do we need in order to actually reach those big targets and create the abundance? One of the things that, I mean, obviously, I'm, uh, you know, Steve, I'm, I was just going to say, just don't screw it up. I mean, the main thing is if governments will allow entrepreneurs to actually be entrepreneurs. Because these moonshots are not led by big companies doing big company thinking. They're led by new entrants changing the rules of the game. And so having, you know, even like governance-free zones, you think about like in the U.S., the FDA is such a barrier to innovation. What if you could carve out a region that was an FDA-free zone? or regulation-free zone, in any sense of the word, SEC-free for Bitcoin inventors, what have you. Places where you could allow experimentation to happen because that's where all the great ideas come from. And so, rather than a collaboration with someone, I think it's a lack of interference that I would highlight. Interesting, interesting. And that is actually is what I was saying, that you know, in developed countries, as the country becomes more mature, mm -hmm. you start to see that they become more and more regulated. And that's why more of the later innovations, latest innovation, especially in healthcare, are moving to other countries. So if you look at CRISPR, that allows us to genetically edit our own genes, is now they're doing it in China, they're doing it in UK. It's not happening in US. The stem cell therapies are moving to other places. The cloning is moving to other places. And if we are not careful, the Western world is going to start to uh, essentially lose the innovation edge because there are so many regulations. So I completely agree with Steve. Creating a you know innovation lab, the regulation-free zone. So it's not a, a tax-free zone anymore. You know the in, you know and the boundaries of the countries are disappearing. To some extent, the entrepreneurship have no boundaries. And the capital is not patriotic. The capital flows where the opportunities are. So whether you are in Finland, if you can create the opportunities in Finland, the money will flow to Finland. You create the opportunities in India and China, money will flow there. So all you have to do is get out of the way and allow the entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurs. And more than that, I would say is allowing people to dream so big that people think it's absolutely crazy and creating a culture where where failure is not considered a failure. As an entrepreneur, you never fail until you give up. You simply pivot. Every <laughs> idea that does not work is the idea that becomes a stepping stone to a new idea. So entrepreneurs pivot, and they only fail when they give up. Exactly. So, yeah, I love your thinking, and I think like, your, your mindset is somehow exponential, so to say. So how can we enable other entrepreneurs and, you know, anywhere in the world to basically obtain the similar mindset? How can we, how can we build that and encourage that? Well, I think there's a variety of ways. Maybe Naveen will talk about Singularity University and some folks that help train in that regard. I think um, simply if you use log, semi-log paper and graph Moore's Law on it and just spend some time contemplating that almost in a meditative state, um, you can get there. What I mean by that is Moore's Law, doing this exponential curve, I fixate on it. Um, when you plot it on a logarithmic scale, it's a straight line. And I think, for whatever reason, in our minds, we make piecewise linear approximations of the near future. In other words, we see a couple examples of something, we assume that it's going to continue in a straight line. I think we're incapable of internalizing exponential curves. We just can't do it. So convert the data set, make it logarithmic, so you can literally plot a straight line on a log paper, and you can think the way Ray Kurzweil has done throughout his career, oh, what, five years from now, computers are going to be able to do this that they can't do today, and 10 years, and 20 years, and build business plans and forecasts that anticipate that change. Mm -hmm. So things like speech recognition for under a dollar in every product. Well, that's within two years. 
right? So what we see today, like an Alexa voice command from Amazon, imagine that could be in every Roomba, every little consumer product that is cheaper than putting buttons on a product. And th like, that's obvious. If you just look at Moore's Law and be like, oh wait, that, like what cost X today will cost one thousandth of that in 10 years. Let's build products that anticipate that future. So, you know? yeah, I agree. I mean, imagination is the only thing that stops us from doing the great things. So it's not the sky is the limit. The sky is nothing but a figment of our imagination. And you know, when you go from here to the moon, you don't call the mom, mom, just I passed the sky now, right? There is no such thing. So it's simply the imagination that stops us from getting to what we want. And I think Steve is so right. Most people tend to go where the puck is rather than where the puck is going to be. And what exponential technology does is that it challenges the human mind because we can't fathom where the things are going to be. And people start to always look at the things very linearly. And I think that Steve was mentioning that, you know, if you think about taking 30 steps, every one of us can say 30 steps is going to from here to maybe the corner of the room. But if you talk about 30 exponential steps, that means two, four, eight, is very few people will ever imagine you would have gone multiple times around the planet. And it's just as human mind can't fathom. And that's where the disruptive steps come from. It's not even the primary, as we were talking backstage, it's not even just a primary impact of the technology. It is the secondary and the tertiary impact of the technology that's really mind-boggling for most people. So when you look at the autonomous car, we can obviously think how it's going to disrupt the automotive industry because you don't need to own the car anymore. You can essentially always be on demand. What does it really mean to the caterpillars of the world because you don't need to build as many roads? What does it really mean to the parking lots because the cars don't need to be parked right next to you? So imagine all the empty parking lots in the urban infrastructure. What if could they become the habitat for affordable housing? Exactly. What if you could live now in the suburbs and now your car is your office? What happens to the real estate in the urban areas? What happens to the auto insurance? What happens to life insurance? Because cars are communicating with each other, people are living longer, the healthcare technology is making us no longer sick, or even curing the last disease called aging. And what if you could cure aging? What would that mean to the life insurance industry? So I think it's just you have to keep imagining all the things that are possible, and the good thing is the technology is at our disposal to make it happen. The there's, there's something he said I want to emphasize that I just love. Um, if we're living in the matrix, I think our mantra should not be there is no spoon, it should be there is no sky. I like that a lot. <laughs> like in case it. you don't know, there isn't like an edge to the atmosphere, it's like this continual gradient, so it's like literally true and figuratively, because we always say the sky's the limit, well, not anymore. Not right? anymore, exactly. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that both of you, so you've invested in a number of very successful companies, and you've built a number of very successful companies. But he's never invested in my company, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we can have that discussion right after, you know, the panel. Um, but I know that there are a lot of startups convincing and needing to convince investors right now in this venue about how do you make money, where do you get your first revenues, how do you create the business model that brings you, you know, uh, that gets you there to the moonshot. And I think the big question is, how do you build something as of today that is relevant, that takes you there to the big goal? Is there a recipe so that gonna, you can share with all the... All the I'm going to talk from the entrepreneur's, entrepreneur's perspective here. because Steve has a very different perspective from the venture capitalist perspective. To me, the capital flows if you can show the, how big the opportunity is, right? So my job is to... Sh capture the imagination of how big this opportunity can be, what this moonshot really means, and capture the imagination, and start to show how you're going to go from here to there, and what are the different paths, what's the short-term things, intermediate things, and the long-term things. So for example, when I say I'm going to make sickness optional, What's my first thing? I'm going to simply look at the metabolome and microbiome and show you that you can stay well. And it's a wellness industry. You don't need to have any FDA regulation. So I can start to make 
you start to generate revenue from personalized nutrition, personalized probiotics. And the second phase is now I can start to diagnose all the diseases when we get FDA approval. That kicks off the second phase. And the third phase is now we have enough data to be able to find the predictive biomarkers that we can essentially cure before you even see the symptoms. And that's what I think the venture capitalists or anyone would like to see is there is a massive opportunity, but they have a path to get to the moonshot. Steve? Yeah, I, um, I love the question. I wish I had an answer because in a sense, this is the question I'm trying to answer every single year in my career, and I don't have the answer. But um, what, well, the way I, if I was to restate your question the way I understood it is you want to invest in companies that are going to change the world, that have this dream, this star, I, I would describe it on the horizon, that says, you know, 50 years from now, all vehicles will be electric, all vehicles will be autonomous, we're going to have Mars colonies, we're going to do all these great things. And that's what motivates the SpaceX employees and the Tesla employees to come to work each day. So you have this incredible dream, but you need to do something in the interim, right? You don't just hunker down for 30 years and come out with the conclusion, right? And so you have this strange dichotomy. You have a dream that's big, but you need to iterate with customers. You need to have a product. And the part of the question that I find very interesting and difficult to answer is how do some people do this so well? So consider Elon Musk, who I think exactly. may be the world's greatest entrepreneur in history. Well, at least he has some so far. financial problems every once in a while, oh, and you absolutely. probably know. He's come to <laughs> net negative net worth and put everything he has into his company. So his personal dedication is, is legend. But if we take today as a sort of a looking back on recent history, both Tesla and SpaceX, you'd say, wow, they had a big audacious dream. Get us off fossil fuels, get us on a Mars colony. About as big as it gets. Yet, brilliant execution on very bite-sized steps along the way, the Roadster strategy and the way it allowed for low volume manufacturing to it sort of blaze the trail, gain credibility such that they could do the Model S, which allowed them to gain credibility to do the Model 3, which is coming out. That was all laid out in a blog post before they had done any of it. So yep. this is fascinating that he just like threw it out there and did exactly that. In the case of SpaceX, it wasn't go with the Mars Colonial Transporter. There was a Falcon 1 rocket that tested the engine, which is the most complicated technology in a rocket, get it proven, then step and repeat nine engines, plus some tenths up on top, same engines for the Falcon 9. This sort of modular design and reuse that software engineers do so naturally, he did through a hardware product landscape to remove risk at every step along the way, gain credibility along the way, and thereby raise financing at ever, you know, when the big checks have to be written, at ever higher prices, you know, tens of billions of dollars of valuation when you're still a company in the growth phase. A company, frankly, hadn't even done an audit at that point, and they're raising just incredible sums of money. That's the thing I wish I knew the formula. That's, that's like, where can I find more Elon Musks or yep. people that think that way? And sometimes you know it when you see it, but I wish I could give them a playbook. Yep. And yeah. so if anyone can get the answer to your question, I'm all ears. Somebody, uh, yeah. somebody needs to write a book about this and really yeah. explain the, the recipe. Well, I don't know if Obviously, it's going to be... Like, if someone could at least articulate an answer... Well, you did. I mean, you did a good I, job. I, Find I, the next Elon, but like, how here. do I know? Like, you know, it's so hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, okay, let's jump to, uh, well, the same topic still, abundance and moonshots, but to our turbulent times. Um, even though the world is ever more abundant. We are seeing jobs disappearing. We are seeing a nationalist backlash that threatens to, well, take us back and start an era of insecurity. What can we do to solve this thing? How can we make sure? And what is the role of entrepreneurs to basically push us forward from this era of insecurity towards yep. the abundance where, yeah. you know, how can we overcome these obstacles so, that we're seeing. Let me seeing. give you a tangible example, make sure everyone in the room knows what we're talking about. So if you read Peter DeManus' book, Ab Abundance, you can imagine leaping to a future yep. where robots do every menial task that a human currently does, brack baking, you know, all of agriculture, all of manufacturing is robotic. People are the indentured rich of the past, right? Because we have machines doing our bidding and we're, we don't really need to work. We could be like most of human history where there were no jobs and you had slave labor. The, the robots and the AIs are our slaves in the future. It's kind of a weird metaphor mix. <laughs> Humans aren't doing any of that because they're not competitive. That might be nirvana or that might be hell. But the nirvana path presumes that we transition in a peaceful way around employment, around healthcare, around rights, basic Mas Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so I think all else being equal, we're doomed. And entrepreneurs love to solve problems. And so I think they will solve this problem. They'll look at this transition and say, well, we need free healthcare forever. Check, let's work on that. Free education for all. People are working on that. Um, and so forth. I think all physical goods will cost a dollar a pound. 
But there are a lot of transition issues, and I don't think politicians, for example, think about that this way, that we're moving to a period of 80% unemployment on a transition to an even higher percentage. What they instead focus on is the symptoms, like immigration policy, or um, protectionism and trade and, uh, between nations, or looking at China and complaining about what they're doing in manufacturing. Those, that's missing the point. Those are the symptoms of a much bigger, irreversible, long-term trend, and as long as someone can identify it, they can work on solutions instead of patching all the symptoms. Well, I think Steve said it pretty, uh, you know, brightly here that, you know, these geographical boundaries must disappear because entrepreneurs don't look at these geographical boundaries. Our basic needs are going to become free. They're going to become democratized and they're going to become demonetized. And when all the basic needs are free, that actually could, you could argue, creates unemployment, but you could argue that creates a new type of employment where it allows each one of us to be creative to do the things that we never had time to do. And in fact, the, you know, in the past, the history has shown that even today, the 50% of the jobs that exist today did not exist 20 years ago. So that means the new types of jobs are being created every single day. Who would have ever thought there's going to be a job for machine learning or a big data analytics? And as your list goes on, that new types of jobs are going to be created. But more than that, if you don't have to work for the basic needs, then you'll be always working for solving a bigger problem, right? Whether it is creating a multi-planetary society, allowing for us to move away from a single point of failure. And we all know that going to the Mars is the ultimate goal, but I still believe the moon is the first stepping stone because moon is only three days away rather than six months away. So in fact, the problems are very similar. High radiation, the wide temperature difference and low gravity, mm -hmm. and if you can solve that, and which is very solvable, then you'd rather be a lunatic three days away than be a Martian six months away, and with M drive, you could argue that M drive, the electromagnetic drive propulsion, would allow, you for, allow for humans to go from Earth to the moon in four hours. That's faster than going from San Francisco to New York. So imagine mm -hmm. if you can connect the moon and the earth and we all could be together and as if we are physically on eighth continent which just happens to be easier to get to than going from San Francisco to New York. Naveen, I have to ask you, how do you see us going to the space will help us reach abundance here on earth and obviously mm -hmm. in the universe? Well, it's, I think it'll, more than that, it will create world peace. And here's why I say that. If you think about what we fight over, we fight over land, we fight over water, and we fight over energy. All we have to do is look up, and we see nothing but abundance of land. Remember, we are a tiny pale blue dot in our own galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies. It's simply the mindset that says we can't live there. What if we could live there? Abundance of water, there is nothing but water in the space, and there is abundance of energy. In fact, even on planet Earth, every 90 minutes, more energy, solar energy falls on us than we use in the whole year. All we have to do is simply convert that. And that is happening. Even the radiation, imagine the nature has already done the job for us. We find the bacteria that is thriving in the radioactive nuclear waste. What if we can take the genes from those bacteria and use the CRISPR technology to modify us humans? So not only we survive in the radiation, we use the radiation as energy. So instead of eating pizza, we're going to say, baby, make, give me some more radiation. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Hey, Steve, you said that mm -hmm. you invest in companies primarily because you really want to learn from them. So tell us the biggest learnings from you know, working together with SpaceX. Oh, from SpaceX. <laughs> wow. Well, SpaceX is incredible. I think some of the learnings have been the power of simulation. So everything that they fly, they have this test rig that, that in a sense, makes it like if you close your eyes and ears, all, you think about what comes to your brain, it's all sensory input, right? And philosophers have debated what is reality but what your senses tell you. Same is true for autonomous cars and spacecraft. All they know is what their various sensors, radars, lidars, cameras are telling them. Well, you can spoof those in a simulated world and test millions and billions of iterations such that many of the products work the first time, be it in autonomous cars or in autonomous rockets. And so that ability to simulate for first-time success is astounding. And you see SpaceX pushing so far ahead. If I was to abstract that a bit, what I've learned is the value of process innovation. Investing in companies that have a reason why they'll keep 
outpacing others versus a given product or patent that they rest their hat on. So, you know, it's, it's more of a dynamic game. Why will this engineering team continue to out-innovate the other engineering teams in a competitive market? Usually relates to a process internally, not externally visible, that gives them an advantage. We see that in synthetic biology companies that use artificial evolution to their advantage. We see this in companies using deep learning and other iterative algorithms to build software stacks to leave everyone else scratching their head when they just focus on the product. And I really am trying to turn my locus of learning personally from product decisions to process decisions, even within the venture firm. Like, how do we hire? How big should the team be? How do we vote? That might be more important than is China or clean tech or early stage a those kind of product decisions, they aren't really what matters. It's more like how big's your team? How diverse cognitively is your team? Those kind of process variables are frankly more important. And that's what Steve Jobs focused most of his career on too. It wasn't a product, it was the process of Apple internally. Exactly. exactly. You know. I love those takeaways. Um, before we end, if uh, I may just one add thing. to one thing that Steve said, I think mm -hmm. it's really the leadership that entrepreneurs bring, which is really the culture that gets created. So really it's the leadership of how they manage the team. They don't manage them as resources. They don't manage them. They inspire them. And they really get the best out of them because the people who work there are inspired to, for a cause that they believe in. And it's not about a person. It becomes the cause for the, every single person who works there. Exactly. And Speaking about inspiration, just before, just before uh, we came here last week, spoke with, with Jane, uh, Naveen, and, and he said that in case we get a percent, one percent of people inspired and really, you know, um, continue pushing their dreams and making them come reality, we are, we've succeeded. So I have to ask the audience, how many of you are inspired after this discussion? Raise your hands if you have. <laughs> I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it, guys. So thank you so much, uh, Steve Jurvetson and Naveen Jain, for you, sharing the stage with me. Thank, thank you. you so much.